Good morning. I've had the opportunity to live in a number of different cities in Canada. And what I've noticed about various cities is that each one has their own personality. I've lived a lot of my life in Calgary and it has a certain personality to it. Uh, Vancouver has a different personality than Calgary. Uh, Southern Ontario cities each have their own personalities as well. And of course, Winnipeg has its own personality that is different than any other place. One of the distinctives I've noticed about Winnipeg is that Winnipeggers believe there is one way to do things. The right way, of course, right? Winnipeggers have developed a sense of this is the right way to do things. And there is only usually one, maybe two ways to get at doing something. I think that's partly because Winnipeggers have had to deal with some adversity. Uh, this past winter was just one example. It was a harsher winter than most winters in Winnipeg. And Winnipeggers deal with that kind of adversity. And there's one way to deal with that adversity and one way to deal with winter. And that is a distinctive of Winnipeg. Often in survival situations, there is only one way to survive, and that's how we develop these sorts of personalities, isn't it? My own ancestors uh, immigrated from England many years ago, and some of them landed in this area of the country, in Burnside, just a little bit west of Winnipeg. They landed there in the fall and had to survive through the winter so that they could plan to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall and be able to survive the year. They didn't have a home. And so how did they survive uh, on this harsh land uh, with uh, a winter coming on? Well, they cut chunks of sod out of the ground and built a sod house. They ended up living in that sod house for, I think, uh, two or more years before they could order a prefab house from the Sears catalog, which was what you could do at that time, which was trucked in by ox cart from High River, Alberta. That was survival. Living in a sod hut on the bald prairie of Manitoba. I'm told that the sod house was pretty good at keeping out the rain when it first started, but often after the rain had ended, the, it would rain inside the sod house for a couple of days afterwards. It was not a pleasant way to live, and yet they survived, and they developed ways to survive. And so you can see that that sort of harsh environment tends to help people to develop ways that are the right way to survive. The late uh, BC church or B, the late BC Jewish culture had to learn how to survive as well. In the years 135 to 66 uh, BC, the Jews were under the Roman Empire and they were uh, persecuted by the Romans at that time. And they, at one point, were all expelled from Rome. And uh, about 40 AD, they were expelled from Rome. And they had to learn how to do things a way that helped them survive. And so this led to the development of many different uh, of their rules and regulations that went even beyond the laws that Moses had given them. And so, they learned how to do things the right way. Because of this need to survive, they knew what was right and they knew what was wrong, including things like what we'll see in our passage today. Uh, part of the right way was for men's and women's roles to be very distinctive. So the typical way for a Jewish house household to function would have been for the the women to be in the kitchen, 
doing the work of the kitchen. The men would be in the common area of the house discussing religion or politics. And the children would be outside playing someplace. That was just the way it was. And it was the right way to do things. And we'll find today that sometimes that was disrupted. Of course, the early Christians were also persecuted by both Jewish religious authorities and the Roman Caesars. In each case, persecution, survival, and fear of death made people look for the one way to live. So, Winnipeggers, which I admire for their belief that there's one way to do things right, and Christians and Jews and early settlers all have this in common, that they developed ways of doing things that were considered the right way. We're going to look at our passage of scripture from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 today. It's a short few verses here, about five verses that we'll read together. But it's a pow there's a powerful message in these five verses. Jesus has come to the home of his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Uh, other than his own disciples that he spent the most time with, these three individuals, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, were probably some of the people that he uh, spent the rest of his time with, or, or much of his time with these three individuals as well. He spent many times in their home, and he brought his disciples there, and it was kind of like a, a home base for him and his disciples in some sense. He loved this family, and they were a family that he trusted and respected, and they trusted him. On this occasion, like many others, Jesus is teaching in the common area of the house. We don't know who all is there. We suspect most of the disciples were there. Um, probably Lazarus was there. And we see that Mary is in this common room with Jesus. And Martha is in the kitchen preparing the food. So it would have been a good-sized uh, crowd of people that, that Martha and maybe some servants in the kitchen are preparing food for. And there would have been much bustling going on in the kitchen and a good bit of conversation going on in the common room with the men. Now, Mary, we're told, is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, N.T. Wright, in one of his commentaries, says we shouldn't make too much of that. Uh, because Paul in Acts chapter 22 verse 3 says that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which is just a way of saying that he was a disciple of the rabbi Gamaliel. So whether Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet literally and gazing up into his eyes lovingly, or whether she's just there amongst the men in that common room, the fact is she's there in the common room with the man. This would have been a bit of a, a social disruption, and Jesus seems to be encouraging it here in this situation. Martha, on the other hand, is totally distracted, we're told. What does distracted mean? Well, she's off track. She is not thinking the right way. She's bustling about. She's worried about the food for this large crowd. She's, she's worried that she'll, she won't get things done on time and that things won't be ready in the right order. And she's maybe worried that it won't be good enough or there won't be enough food. Or perhaps there's a little bit of her pride on the line here too, that she wants everyone to feel like, oh, Martha, that was a marvelous meal you made for us. Oh, that was great. And, you know, we all have like to take pride in our work. Perhaps Martha was feeling a little bit of that pressure as well. Perhaps she was directing a bunch of servants in the kitchen and maybe some of that was not going well. But Martha goes out and she complains to Jesus. And her complaint indicates that she's not thinking about what's happening in the common room. It's not, she's not serving what's happening in the common room. She's no longer serving the teaching that Jesus is doing. No, she's worried and fussing 
about many things in the kitchen. Now, Jesus replies to her, and I love what we get from the text that shows he's very gentle with Martha. Uh, some of the translations say, dear Martha, but the original Greek says more like Martha, Martha. You can hear the gentleness in his tone. You are worried and upset about all of these details. Now, clearly Jesus is not chastising her for working in the kitchen. Uh, there's a good-sized crowd in the common room, and they're going to want to eat at some point. Uh, someone has to do that work, and Martha has taken on that role. No, he's gently chastising her for being worried and upset. Uh, she's probably worried about Mary's scandalous behavior of hanging out with the man in the common room. But Jesus isn't worried about that, even if Martha is. Jesus says the most interesting thing in this passage when he says, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. There is only one thing to be concerned about. That, that kind of sounds like what we talked about at the beginning of this message. We said that there is one way to do things, the right way. Jesus here is saying there's only one thing to be concerned about, and if you get that right, everything else follows. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Well, surely every Winnipegger will want to know what this one thing is. What is this one thing? What is the one thing that, we, uh, that is worth being concerned about? For if Jesus says in that time that there's one thing worth being concerned about, we can bet that it's, this, it's also worth being concerned about today in our world. But what is that one thing worth being concerned about? Well, of course, taken at face value, uh, what Mary has found that is worth being concerned about is listening to Jesus. Sitting there listening to Jesus is the one thing that is most important. And certainly that is true, that listening to the words of Jesus is important, and, and it is the one thing. And... Today, we listen to the words of Jesus by reading our Bibles and listening to his words um, and understanding how he was prophesied throughout the Old Testament and then listening to his words in the New Testament. But it, it goes a little deeper than just listening to his words or just reading the Bible. For we're told that from the gospel writers and from the epistles of Paul, that Jesus himself is the word of God. And so not only are we to listen to his words, but we are to recognize that he is the word. In John's gospel, it tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that God came and dwelt amongst us. The Word of God came into our world. That is the one thing. Not only do we listen to his words, but we listen to Jesus who is the Word of God. The other passage that we had read in our service today, uh, found in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 and then uh, verse 28, is also another reminder of who Jesus is for us. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. 
Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Then I'm going to skip down to verse 28. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. What is the one thing worth being concerned about? Jesus. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He created the universe. He sustains the universe. He died on the cross for us. It's like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the one thing, the one thing worth being concerned about. Jesus Christ and him crucified. The band Jars of Clay has a song called Liquid. Uh, let me read part of the lyrics to us. Arms nailed down, are you telling me something? Eyes turned out, are you looking for someone? This is the one thing, the one thing that I know. Blood-stained brow, are you dying for nothing? Flesh and blood, is it so elemental? This is the one thing, the one thing that I know. This is the one thing, the one thing that I know. Blood-stained brow. He wasn't broken for nothing. Arms nailed die. Arms nailed down, rather. He didn't die for nothing. This is the one thing, the one thing that I know. The song never really makes explicit what is the one thing, but it has all of these images of the cross and Christ crucified. And the Latin chant that begins the song, when it's translated, uh, says, The Lamb has redeemed the sheep. The innocent Christ has reconciled sinners to the Father. This is the one thing. The one thing that I know, the one thing being worth being concerned about. The one thing is Jesus Christ and him crucified, just as Paul says. This is the one thing worth being concerned about. Jesus, only Jesus, and Jesus crucified. Now, we can't sit physically at the feet of Jesus these days and listen to him. But we can listen to his words in the Bible, and we can recognize him as the one thing that we should be concerned about in our lives. But what about poor Martha? Do we just kind of shake our heads and go, oh, poor Martha, she missed the point? Well, no. Uh, Martha can still redeem herself by doing the work in the kitchen, but also focusing on what's going on in the other room. Maybe she couldn't hear, but she could focus on what her role was in helping Jesus to serve the world. Brother Lawrence was a monk in a monastery in Paris in the 1600s. He, like Martha, spent most of his time in the kitchen. Yet in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, he showed us how we can be present with God while we are busy in the kitchen. He talked about peeling potatoes and being in the presence of Jesus. So what do we learn from this passage? There is one thing being worth concerned about, and that is Jesus. 
that's good news for Winnipeggers who like to find the one thing that's important and do the one thing that's important. If we cultivate that relationship with Jesus, the worries of the kitchen and the worries of the world will fall away. Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better part. Will we too choose the better part? Will we choose to focus on Jesus and Jesus Christ crucified for us? Amen.